All right, hello and welcome to the February Crane Research Forum. Thank you all for joining us here today. We're glad that you're here. My name is Dr. Rebecca Dorr and I'm the Director of Research here at the Crane Center for Early Childhood Research and Policy. Um, for our session today, my colleague Kathy is going to be monitoring our chat box and we'll be adding housekeeping keeping items there. Um, these monthly forums feature research on emerging or key topics that impact the field of early child care and education. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Vlad Kogan and Dr. Stéphane Levartou. Dr. Vlad Kogan is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Ohio State University. Dr. Kogan studies state and local government in the United States and focuses his research on the intersection of politics and public policy in areas including education and social policy. Dr. Stéphane Levartou is a Crane Center Faculty Associate and Professor and Director of Doctoral Studies at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs. Dr. Levar too conducts policy relevant research to help improve K-12 public education here in Ohio. Recently, they conducted detailed analyses on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected student learning using data from Ohio's state tests in the spring of 2021. Today, they will share their findings from some of that research. And with that, I will turn it over to you all. Great, well, um, thanks so much for, uh, for inviting us to present and I hope everybody can see my, my slides. Excellent. Good. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to join all of you uh, and to share some of the recent trends in academic performance of Ohio K-12 students, um, how these trends have been impacted by the pandemic, and I think most importantly, what we see is the most pressing issues um, in the space today. So this presentation is based on an analysis that Stefan and I completed in early fall, although I, at the end, I'll touch briefly on some recent developments since then. And I'm going to, in the chat window, I'm going to put a link to the full report for those who are interested if you want to um, if you want to find it and, and or have it available to you as well. Um, so everything I say reflects our interpretation um, of the evidence. And so I want to make clear that we're not speaking on the behalf of the Ohio Department of Education, which provided the data for analysis. And in fact, I, I'm sure that they probably are not going to agree with some of the editorial comments I make along the way. Um, all right. Great. So specifically, um, uh, I'll be discussing the results from the Ohio State tests that were com completed by students in spring of 2021. And as many of you know, testing was suspended in spring of 2020. So really spring of 2021 provides the first statewide opportunity to examine the pandemic impacts across different grades and subjects. Um, this presentation focuses specifically on students in grades fifth through 10 and on their achievement in English, English language arts and in mathematics. Um, in our analysis, we use statistical adjustments to provide an apples to apples um, comparison and ensure that the test results from last spring are truly comparable to state assessments from before the pandemic. And specifically, we count for somewhat lower rates of test participation this past spring um, and potential changes in the demographics of students attending Ohio public schools. We know that the pandemic has significantly reduced public school enrollment in many places. So counting for such differences is important. And as far as we've been able to tell, not something that most other states have done um, when they released their test results from last spring. So to isolate the impact of the pandemic, we examined student achievement growth over time. So essentially comparing each student's test scores in spring of 2021 to the same student's academic performance on the last round of the state assessments two years ago, before the start of the pandemic. For example, uh, we compare the state test scores of fifth graders last spring to how those same students performed in spring 2019 when they were in third grade. And in addition, we compared the third to fifth grade achievement growth among the most recent cohort of fifth graders to students who were enrolled in these same grades prior to the pandemic. In other words, we asked how much lower fifth grade test scores were last year compared to otherwise identical students with similar third grade achievement who were in fifth grade prior to the pandemic. And of course, fifth grade is just one example. We use the same methodology for all the grades and subjects we examine. Uh, when discussing pandemic-related learning impacts, we think it's most useful to focus on a metric known as standard deviation units, which for some of you may be familiar, but for others may be totally foreign. Um, and I know it sounds unintuitive, so I'm going to translate it into other measures that are easier to interpret along the way. However, we focus on standard deviations because this allows us to benchmark the magnitude of the learning losses Ohio students have experienced against other research. So we can speak about the kinds of interventions necessary to address learning disruptions of this size and how these impacts are likely to affect Ohio students' later life outcomes. Um, 
In addition, this measure addresses well-known methodological problems with other commonly used metrics, such as percent students achieving grade level proficiency. But as I said before, um, we'll provide a translation for you and other metrics that will likely be more familiar to everyone here. All right. So this graph provides a really high level overview of our results. Uh, it shows separate estimates of learning losses for English language arts, which is in dark red, and in math, which is in dark blue. You'll see that all the bars are negative, meaning that student performance in spring 2021 was lower than we would expect given the performance of otherwise similar Ohio students in earlier years. First, uh, I want to draw your attention to just two important points. First, learning losses appear to be larger in math than in ELA. ELA test scores were on average 0.1 to 0.2 standard deviations lower than we would have expected prior to the pandemic. In math, scores declined by about 0.3 standard deviations. Second, there are some differences across grade levels, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. But importantly, it is clear that even our oldest students who were in high school last year have had their learning substantially disrupted by the pandemic. This finding is worth emphasizing given the limited amount of time we have to remediate these losses before students finish their K-12 education journey. So how large are these effects? Based on widely used national benchmarks, we estimate that Ohio students were between one third and one half of a year behind in English language arts last spring compared to their expected achievement prior to the pandemic. In math, students were between one half to a whole year behind. And I provide these ranges because the precise estimates vary somewhat across grades. So to put these disruptions into perspective, they represent an eight percentage point decrease in the proportion of students who achieved grade level proficiency in ELA and a 15 percentage point decrease in math proficiency. We know that the amount of students uh, typically learn varies across grades with more growth in earlier ages and smaller gain, gains as the students move through middle and high school. Thus, relative to these typical learning trajectories, the estimates, uh, the estimates I just showed you um, correspond to proportionally larger disruptions for older students, especially in mathematics. I know some are skeptical about standardized testing, so it's important to think about what these numbers actually mean in the real world. There's a large body of research in economics that maps student achievement on these kinds of tests to their later life outcomes. Using the best estimates we can find, the test score declines I just described will depress the lifetime income of Ohio students by about 0.3%, oh, sorry, by, by about 3% if left unaddressed. Uh, the impact on the state economy as a whole is even larger, corresponding to a 6% decrease in future Ohio GDP. So in current dollars, uh, that amounts to more than 1.5 trillion. This number comes from an analysis presented uh, before the Ohio State Legislature by Stanford economist Eric Hanushek in January 2018, when he estimated the impact of a 0.25 standard deviation increase in Ohio test scores on the state economy. So far, we've been talking about average impacts, but it's important to recognize that some student populations have suffered particularly large learning disruptions. In English language arts, we found that historically disadvantaged groups saw particularly large declines in their achievement. And this is true by every definition of disadvantage we examined, whether that's student race, socioeconomic status as measured by eligibility for free and reduced price lunch, qualification for special education services, and whether students were non-native English speakers. By contrast, the declines in math were consistently large and roughly of similar magnitude across all student subgroups. Another important dimension is mode of instruction. We know that in many parts of the state, schools reopened for full-time in-person learning in fall of 2020. But some districts relied on various forms of hybrid learning throughout much of last year. And a handful of districts remained almost completely virtual through last February. Using weekly data on the mode of instruction submitted by each district to the Ohio Department of Education, we grouped districts based on their primary method of instruction. Across grade levels and subjects, we found that students who had access to full-time in-person learning starting in the fall saw smaller decreases in their achievement than peers attending districts that relied primarily on hybrid and online instruction. Let me now provide some details on the magnitude of these differences. In this graph, we plot estimates of pandemic-related achievement impacts separately by student race and ethnic group. As before, we use dark red for English language arts and dark blue for math. In the interest of space, this graph and those that follow in the next few slides focus on fifth graders, although we see generally similar patterns across other grades as well. As this graph illustrates, the achievement declines in math were quite similar across various racial and ethnic groups in a neighborhood of about 0.35 standard deviations. 
with somewhat larger impacts for Asian American students. In ELA, by contrast, we see much larger differences with test score declines for African American students about two times larger than among white students. Again, all of the precise numbers differ somewhat across grades. We see this pattern consistently across all grades. I should emphasize that we already had significant differences in test scores among student subgroups, racial and otherwise, before the pandemic. The numbers in this graph represent learning losses above and beyond the gaps that already existed. Put simply, the pandemic exacerbated many of the pre-existing achievement gaps amongst Ohio students. In this graph, uh, we now group students based on the type of school district they attend, rural, town, suburban, and urban. And these are definitions that come from a typology used by the Ohio Department of Education. Once again, you see generally similar learning impacts across the board in math. But in English language arts, the achievement declines were largest amongst the state's urban districts and smallest in suburban districts. Overall, the average student in Ohio's urban districts saw their ELA test scores decline by nearly three times more than students attending suburban districts. Again, this is on top of the existing achievement gaps between urban and suburban districts that preceded the pandemic. The achievement gaps, at least in ELA, have clearly grown worse. Finally, in this graph, we group students based on the primary mode of instruction used by their district of attendance during the 2020-2021 school year, so last year. On the left, you see estimates for districts that spent most of the school year in full-time in-person instruction. And on the right are estimates for districts that spent most of the year in virtual learning. Finally, in the middle are districts that use some form of hybrid teaching or a combination of in-person and virtual instruction over the course of the year. In both math and ELA, we see that students with greater access to in-person learning saw smaller achievement impacts, although the differences were more pronounced in ELA than for math. Again, this is a pattern we saw across all grades. Finally, it is important to note that the pandemic had a negative impact on all students, even those whose schools operated largely as before, starting in fall of 2020. All the numbers I've shared with you thus far are based on students who attended traditional public schools last year. So let me just spend a few comments on uh, charter schools. First, comparing pandemic-related learning disruptions across sectors is tricky because of differences in the composition of the students that different types of schools serve. In Ohio, we know that charter schools are located primarily in our urban areas and enroll disproportionately lower income minority students. And as I showed you in the earlier slides, these are precisely the student subgroups who experienced the most pronounced achievement impacts during the pandemic, even among students attending traditional public schools. Because it's difficult to separate impacts due to how different schools adjusted to the pandemic from differences due to the type of students they serve, our comments here are necessarily more tentative and suggestive. So with that caveat in mind, here's what we know. When examining all districts statewide, we found few consistent differences between traditional public schools uh, and brick and mortar charter schools. In younger grades in ELA, charter schools appeared to post somewhat larger achievement declines. However, this was not true in math. And in older grades, we found some evidence that brick and mortar charter schools actually recorded smaller drops. Across the board, online charter schools generally recorded much smaller decreases. But online charter schools already tended to have much lower achievement growth even before the pandemic. So it is possible that these schools did not have much room to see student scores decline even further once the pandemic hit. In other words, there's a floor for how much test scores can realistically fall during a given period of time. In addition to the statewide analysis, we also compared growth for traditional public schools and charter schools for students who lived in districts that spent most of the last year uh, in remote learning. For these students, charter schools recorded generally smaller achievement declines in math and amongst high school students. But these differences were quite modest uh, in magnitude. Now, we know that schools closed statewide in March of 2020, so perhaps uh, you're thinking that these numbers are not very surprising. And an important question to ask is how much of the declines I just showed you were caused by the school closures in spring of 2020? And relatedly, and probably more importantly, did students start to make up lost ground once they were back in school last fall? The short answer is no. In fact, the best evidence we have suggests that students actually continued to fall further behind even once schools resumed uh, after the initial closures. So this evidence comes from the third grade English language arts exam which has an unusual structure. In other grades, students complete the state tests only once in the spring. But in third grade, students take the same exam twice, once in the fall and once again in the spring. This provides us a truly unique opportunity to figure out 
what was driving their learning losses. So specifically, we examined how far students uh, were behind in October of last year when they took their ELA tests for the first time. And again, how far they were behind the following spring during the second round of tests. If students began to make up lost ground once they returned to school, we would expect narrower losses in spring of 2021 than in fall of 2020. Unfortunately, that is the opposite of what we found. In fact, we saw that student achievement continued to decline. And we estimate that about one third of the overall losses since the start of the pandemic were due to less than expected learning between October of 2020 and spring of 2021 testing windows. Overall, the evidence suggests that Ohio students learned about 20% less than usual between fall and spring testing windows last year, at least in third grade ELA. Unfortunately, we cannot repeat the same analysis for other grades and subjects. So this graph provides some additional details from the third grade uh, data. Since we're talking only about English language arts, all the bars are dark red, continuing the color scheme from the earlier slides. The solid bars show the typical achievement growth that students recorded between fall and spring in the years immediately before the pandemic. And the striped bars, by contrast, provide comparable estimates from the 2020-21 school year. As you see, all student subgroups showed smaller gains between the fall and spring of last year than was the case before the pandemic. However, the gaps are particularly pronounced for Black and Hispanic students. Black students started their test scores grow by 40% less than usual between fall and spring. For Hispanic students, achievement grew by about 35% less than in the pre-pandemic years. In this graph, we group uh, third graders into four equally sized buckets based on their initial test scores in the fall. The first quartile includes students in the bottom 25%, while the bar on the right corresponds to students who were scored in the top 25%. And on the y-axis, we plot the achievement growth between fall and spring testing windows. Two things stand out. First, lower achieving students typically record the largest learning gains in third grade ELA. This means that achievement gaps close over the course of the year as the students who start out most behind make up the most ground. Second, while this was still true last year, the lowest achieving students made considerably smaller gains between fall and spring than was the case in prior years. Overall, the amount of growth students in the bottom quartile recorded fell by more than 20% compared to typical gains in pre-pandemic years. By contrast, students who recorded the highest achievement at the beginning of the year also saw the smallest learning impacts. The growth in their test scores was nearly 95% of normal. So put another way, we made considerably less progress closing achievement gaps last year than before the pandemic. Finally, this graph shows similar fall to spring learning gains by the primary mode of instruction used by school districts last year. As you can see, all districts had generally uh, similar growth in the years before the pandemic. Last year, however, we saw a sharp divergence with districts that relied on remote learning for most of the year, posting about 40% lower achievement growth than their typical gains in prior years. Because we have detailed data on the mode of instruction used by districts for each week of the school year, we can leverage this information as well as the precise timing of the state exams to produce plausibly causal estimates of how mode of instruction impacted student learning last year. Overall, we found that each week of fully remote uh, learning reduced student achievement by about 0.01 standard deviations. This is about one third of the ELA achievement gains that third graders typically make for each additional week of instruction. I wanna emphasize that these estimates are based on student achievement growth between October 2020 and spring 2021. So this is months after districts and teachers had opportunity to adjust to the new modes of instruction and work out any initial kinks. It seems clear, in other words, that remote learning does not work nearly as well as in-person instruction for most students. We believe these numbers speak to the importance of doing all we can to maximize opportunities for in-person learning for Ohio students going forward, as well as the disruptions to these opportunities that we continue to see here in Ohio. Since the numbers I've been presenting are off last spring, let me briefly describe some of the challenges we've seen since then during this academic year. Although Ohio began the school year with much less aggressive student quarantining requirements than some other states, we have seen that quarantines have significantly disrupted learning for many students. So in our home district of Columbus, we know that more than 23,000 students, more than half of the district has been sent into quarantine at least once between the beginning of the school year on August 26th and early January. And Columbus does not seem to be an outlier. A quarter of parents responding to a nationally representative survey 
fielded in late September reported that their child had quarantined since the school year began. And that was more than four months ago. So think of the additional families that kids sent to quarantine since then. Um, in recent weeks, we've also seen the fast spreading Omicron variant significantly reducing both student and teacher attendance across the country. And in some cases, causing schools to move to remote learning. Here in Ohio, some districts, including both Cincinnati and Cleveland, spent the first half of January in fully remote learning. Other bars, restaurants, gyms, and basically all other non-essential services remained open in those cities. Although we don't have definitive data on the impacts of these disruptions until the spring tests this year, uh, and we won't have that until the spring tests, the early warning signs are flashing bright red. For example, student participation data from Zern, an online math platform used in many schools nationally, shows growing evidence of student disengagement disengagement during the Omicron wave. Most concerningly, these impacts are concentrated amongst low-income schools, the same schools that have already suffered the largest learning losses since the start of the pandemic. In my view, we are still, uh, that we are still seeing school closures. Two years into the pandemic and several hundred billion dollars in emergency federal aid later signifies, I think, our collective failure um, to prioritize education and the interests of young people. Consider how far we've gone to keep our hospitals open and our healthcare system from being overwhelmed. But today's students will be tomorrow's epidemiologists, tomorrow's vaccine scientists, and tomorrow's healthcare workers. That we have not put in the same effort to keep our schools open today will make us less prepared for the pandemics of tomorrow, when we'll need the same skilled workforce to keep our society running. So overall, the numbers that I've shared with you are quite sobering. They suggest that the pandemic has caused Ohio students to fall behind academically with our most disadvantaged and at-risk students being impacted the most. And it appears that we're still moving in the wrong direction. I do believe that this analysis also shows how important state tests will be for continuing to track the trajectory of student learning for our students to see if we are successful in making up lost ground. Last spring, I know some policymakers here in Ohio suggested that testing was not a top priority as students returned to the classroom. Uh, some said, quote, we know that students fall behind. We don't need state tests to tell us that. But I hope, as you've seen from our presentation, the tests tell us far more. They show us which student subgroups have been impacted the most, whether students began to recover or fell more behind once schools reopened, and the impact that different modes of instruction have had on their learning. Indeed, Ohio has been a national leader on this front. Last spring, we achieved far higher test participation rates than many other states, thanks to the leadership provided by Governor DeWine and Senate President Huffman and the legislation passed by the General Assembly. We also want to recognize the leadership of the Ohio Department of Education and former Superintendent Paula De Maria in working with us to make this nuanced and careful analysis possible. I know that no one wants to be the bearer of bad news and that the numbers I've presented to you today are difficult to stomach, but we have to know where Ohio students stand if we want to get them back on track. To conclude, the numbers paint a very worrying picture of student achievement in our state. Much is at stake, both for the future of these students and for the economic health of our state. Um, so thank you. And Stefan, I don't know if you want to make any, any closing comments before we turn to the Q&A. No, I think you did a good job summarizing everything. There are some questions that are probably worth discussing in the Q&A, uh, but that was good. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Very interesting presentation. Um, I'll start with one of the questions that we have from Beverly, but other um, people, please continue to add your questions to the Q&A box. Um, and I will relay them over to um, our speakers and, and get some answers. Um, so Beverly asks, do you have any ideas or recommendations to overcome being behind in growth, um, specifically in ELA, and things teachers could add to the classroom or curriculum? And I know this is something there is a lot of people talking about and a lot of funding going, um, going towards right now. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I'm happy to start off in this to fun see, kind of get your take. So um, I guess I guess let me frame, uh, frame this by saying, um, you know, the magnitude of the learning losses that we're talking about. Um, I think if you look historically, if you look at policy evaluations, in the past we have not been able, I think, to find really an intervention that can um, a, a grow uh, st student achievement by this much at scale. So we have small programs that work, but once you try to scale them up, I think we have not had success. So I think that is concerning. I think the best evidence we have really suggests I think two policy levers, right? One is um, really high intensity tutoring, personalized tutoring for students. And two, I think the one thing we know works is more learning time, extended learning time. So that means maybe uh, extended school year, which I know uh, is very unpopular and I know many districts have pushed away from. Um, and I guess, I, you know, the, the one thing I would say is 
regardless of what the intervention is, um, one thing I want to stress is, um, you know, is, is how we design it is really important. So I know many districts that did not extend the school year are having summer school, but it's optional summer school. And anytime you have an optional program, I think it's more likely to be um, uh, taken advantage of by exactly the students that probably need it, need it the least. So targeting these interventions to the right students, I think is just as important as figuring out what the right intervention is. Uh, but that's my, my initial take. Stefan, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with all that. Uh, I think uh, as I just want to reiterate uh, what Vlad said is that when you try to scale up things that uh, we know to have big impacts in small experimental settings like high dose tutoring, um, it, it typically doesn't work quite as well. Um, and in this case, particularly with labor shortage during the pandemic, I could see it working even less well uh, than usual. Um, so uh, tracking down uh, tutors who are gonna be effective and training them all um, in, in just the right way would be very challenging, but that seems to be the, the most hopeful option uh, is to increase learning time and hopefully do it with one-on-one -on -one tutoring if possible. Great, thank you. Um, and we're still waiting for questions to come in. I think we're getting some over in the chat box. I'll go ahead and ask one of my questions. If you asked a question in the chat box, if you could move it over to the Q&A box, um, then I'll make sure we get that addressed. Um, one of the questions that came up for me while you were speaking, um, I thought the data about um, on third grade ELA from fall to spring um, last year was really compelling, and especially that that was true even for the schools that were in person during that time. And I was wondering if you would hypothesize that most of these impacts are due to what's happening in the school being different post COVID and during COVID or things that are happening at home and in the community. I know your data might not be able to speak to that, but I didn't know if you, whether you had any um, thoughts or reactions. Uh, yeah, I, 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 can, I, can, I can start and then Stefan can jump in. So, so um, in this report, um, you know, I think we, we can't separate the two. We did do an earlier evaluation um, from actually fall of last year from the initial third grade test scores. And in that analysis, we looked at some non-school um, non factors. So for example, like areas that were hit harder by COVID in terms of more cases or more hospitalizations um, or more deaths, and also the economic impact of the pandemic. And I think there was two big takeaways from that analysis. So one, um, we did not see in, in the initial round of testing that areas hit harder by COVID had larger learning losses. So that suggested that really it was not kind of pandemic related impacts directly. We did find evidence that um, parts of the state uh, where more people lost jobs initially um, had uh, were hit harder in terms of test scores, but this was kind of orthogonal to to some of the other differences across modes of learning uh, and student subgroups. So it didn't explain some of these gaps. So I think what we're talking about here, you know, my senses, it's primarily what's going on inside the classroom, um, or what's not going on inside the classroom because the students are not attending. Maybe they're staying home, staying home because either they're in quarantine or um, or they're scared to go to school. That's not to say that there's not other things that also affect the achievement. Um, but, but probably would not show up very well in these estimates that we presented. Related to that, in the chat a while back, someone asked a question about uh, whether we had looked to see if uh, someone's economic status or income at home uh, affected the ro remote learning findings. So I, I'm assuming the question is, um, more disadvantaged students, is remote learning more difficult for them? Uh, and I'm trying to remember in the first study if we disaggregated the remote versus not for disadvantaged students versus non-disadvantaged. I don't think we did, did we, Vlad? I, I, yeah, I don't think so, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, unfortunately, I, I think in some ways those three things, especially for last year, are very hard to disentangle because the, the few districts that were remote were also the districts that served the largest number of disadvantaged students. Um, so in some ways, uh, you know, you, you know if, if it is the case that disadvantaged students are less uh, less prepared for remote learning, uh, then, then in some ways, we, those are the students that we that we gave that policy to. So, it, it, yeah, but uh, but yeah, I don't think we we were able to disentangle that either in that in the early report or, or in this one. But I guess it's worth saying yeah. that in general, we know from the literature that those are the students that will struggle most with remote instruction. We just don't know with the, our data. Yeah. And I guess I'll just jump in really fast. You know, I think I think um, a lot of people have been talking about internet access uh, as a barrier to remote learning. I think that's definitely. Um, definitely an issue, but I think we know, you know, we have a huge body of literature on online learning from before the pandemic, um, and that, that all, you know, I think is entirely consistent with this data, and, and what it really teaches us is, you know, aside from the technology barriers, there are also um, skills that you need to be successful online, uh, whether, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, self-control, not having windows open and playing, playing Roblox in a different window, or a time management skills, waking up on time to log in because you don't have to catch a school bus. 
And those skills are not, um, are not equally distributed. Um, not all students have access to, to resources that help them develop those skills. Um, and I think that's really important to keep in mind because that was true before the pandemic. That was what all the research before the pandemic and online learning showed. And so, you know, I, I don't think giving out hotspots and Chromebooks is gonna make the, the online learning issues go away suddenly because those, those, those other skills are still gonna be missing for a large segment of the population. And, and if you don't mind, I'd like to say something about that because um, I, I felt from the chat earlier that maybe some people thought that we were blaming teachers or, or that, um, you know, when we said we got the kinks out uh, by the fall of, uh, of 2020, um, you know, there's a lot more learning that teachers can do in terms of, of figuring out how to do remote well. Uh, but a lot of what makes remote difficult is on the home side, the child side, and we just haven't uh, dis disentangled that. And so we're by no means uh, blaming teachers for ineffective remote instruction. Oh, thanks so much for saying that. And I mean, I taught, I taught online as well. And I can tell you my online class was far worse than my in-person class would have been. So absolutely, uh, I echo that 100%. Thank you. I should just let you guys talk for the next 20 minutes. Um, this is great. We have we have do have other questions coming in. Um, Tracy asks, as employers are doubling down on emotional wellness and behavioral health of their employees to improve their retention and productivity, what are your thoughts on supporting these sorts of aspects as an intervention to improve learning for children? Stefan? The well, I, I know of a couple of studies, at least, that showed that the pandemic had negative impacts on on students' emotional well-being, and, and that's surely part of, of what led to academic declines. I, I don't know research that tells me how much. Uh, Vlad, do you? Um, you know, I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know either. I guess I, I would say, um, yes, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, think, I think it's, uh, I think more, more good stuff is always better, right? Whether it's, it's le academic learning, whether it's social emotional learning. So I think it's, it's we should be doing all of the above. And I guess for me, I would say from a policy standpoint, the question is, is prioritization, right? Um, and, and I guess one thing that concerns me about, about what I've heard in, in, you know, in the policy world recently is you know, that we have to prioritize the social emotional piece until students are, you know, until, until we've addressed that, students can't learn. And I, I, that concerns me, I guess, for, for a couple of reasons. One is for the high school students, we don't have time. So you know, they're gonna graduate and, and they, they need to have the skills when they graduate to be successful. And then two, I guess from a more practical standpoint, you know, um, you know, I think I'm all for you know, doing all the above. I would say that right now um, we have districts that are struggling on like very basic educational functions, like having enough buses to get kids to school um, and having enough substitute teachers. And if we can't do that well, I guess I, 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 I wonder what, what makes us think that we can do the social emotional piece well. So I think, doing the academic piece really well and, and working out those, I mean, clear logistical challenges that I think I know are largely outside of the control of the districts, but figuring out how to solve that to me is priority number one, because doing that kind of not that well and trying to hopefully make up for that with social emotional learning, I don't think in the long run is gonna, is gonna um, I think, work out well. That's again, that's my personal opinion, my, my uh, kind of editorial comment that I know Stefan may disagree with, but um, I just wanna throw that out there. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Marcy Roberts um, asking about special education. So have you looked at or will you look at the impact of identification for special education on your uh, results? I think we did initially. The problem is that the indicator that we use is pretty coarse. And so we don't know what you know was in the IEP. And, um, and, and so I, I, I'm, I wasn't sure exactly what that was telling us. But initially, I didn't, we didn't see significant differences between uh, stu at least in third grade, uh, students who uh, had an IEP and those that didn't. Yeah, I, I think we did see some differences in the in the other um, grades and subjects, and so it's, it's, all that's in our report. There are, I think, some um, some differences across subjects, and there, I think there are some important differences across grades. So I don't want to kind of summarize it inaccurately, but if if you look at the link, and I'm, I'll we post that in the chat again, we actually have tables at the very end that go through um, and kind of report the full set of results, including um, for specific student subgroups. So I, I guess I will I'll kind of. Uh, refer folks to that report and, and to the full estimates there. Thanks. And you may, this may, that may be relevant to this next question, which was um, just about where, where they can find, people can find more information. Um, Vanessa says, great presentation, very compelling data. Um, is the initial information you showed in your presentation that included other elementary grades in your report? It seems the report's just third grade ELA. Um, is that more information public that we can find? Is that all in the link that you're sharing? Yes, so, so just to clarify, so we, we, I focus at the end on third grade because that's the only grade where we have both fall and spring tests. Right. But we look, at, we look at grades five through 10. 
Now, you might say, well, why start with five? Well, part of that is really we're concerned about changes in student composition. And having prior test scores is really, really important for us statistically to really make sure that we have an apples to apples comparison. And in Ohio, students take their first test in third grade, and then we missed a year of testing last year. So fifth grade is really the first grade in 2021 where we had prior test score data, which is why we can't look at earlier elementary grades. Um, but, but I know, I know there's other um, data vendors out there, and I know many districts use in-house testing like iReady or, um, or MAPS assessments. Um, and I think you know, I, I'm sure districts um, have access to probably much, much more fine-tuned data and can go back to those earlier grades as well. But again, I would say I, it's really important when doing these analysis to really to, to um, really to account for compositional change and who's taking tests, and especially on the um, on the iReady and the MAP assessments. We know last year some some especially in the fall, many places were doing the tests at home, and there's I think really compelling evidence that the home test results were really not comparable. That there was some great score inflation there. So really, I think being careful how that, that these analyses are done is really important um, when, when using some of those other data sources. Thank you. Um, I did wonder if you could say more about um, your hypotheses based on the patterns that you saw in the fifth grade and up data on what these losses might look like for younger students. Would you expect them to be larger, smaller, look different? Well, we know we know students learn more in earlier grades, and we in a previous report we also looked at third grade in in, in particular. But are you referring to like kindergarten and first grade and second grade? Right. Well, yeah, I mean it. It, we would love to see earlier testing um, sure. that's systematic across the state so that we could determine such things. Uh, but I suspect that anything that we're seeing at the third grade level is something that uh, is felt down the chain. Um, yeah. and, and so I think third grade is probably a, a, a good approximation of how significant it really is. And so it's, it, it's probably more pronounced. Thank you. Uh, I have a question from Celia Huffman um, asking about out of school opportunities for learning. So was there any opportunity to look at how possible out of school time learning sessions such as community based tutoring may have had an impact? Uh, yes, yeah, so unfortunately, we, we did we could not look at that. Um, and I think, I, you know, I, I, I think that's a great, great point. And, and, and I guess I, I would even frame it more broadly. We know that districts are doing a lot of things now to try to address learning losses and to really be able to evaluate those things to know where they worked. We really need Get good data on it. We need to track which students are doing what, um, and, and you know I, I don't think we, as at a state level, are collecting that data or in the past have collected that data. So I, I, I completely agree that there's a lot of things going on that happened last year, um, and also they're happening this year that that maybe maybe affecting students positively. Um, uh, but but you know I think getting rigorous evaluation done to see how big are these effects um, and, and are they working for different student subgroups is really important. And being able to track students is really important. And, and again, we need the infrastructure in place for that um, in terms of just keeping track of that. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Scott Graves. Uh, you mentioned urban schools in your presentation, but didn't see them reference. But I didn't see them referenced in your report. Is it possible to provide any um, disaggregated information, for example, black children in urban schools? Yeah. We, so we we did not slice the data kind of quite that finely. Um, uh, so so unfortunately, we don't have kind of those those uh, that level of detail. Um, and, and so so you're right. Uh, in our report, we we do have the racial breakdown, but we don't have the the racial breakdown by by different kinds of districts and the urban versus suburban was a, a later addition that we we added in response to some questions we got from policymakers. so that that piece of it um, is not in the report itself thank you uh, jamie o'leary um, asked if you have any plans to look at similar data this year and next and to track the same students over time uh you know i think I, again i asked if myself stefan can, can jump in I, I mean we're certainly happy to help uh you know we, we did this kind of as, as a service to the state you know free of charge uh and, and we're certainly happy i'm happy to do that again um uh and so that's it's really up to um to the policymakers in ohio and the department of education um and and you know if, if they want to partner with us I'm, I'm certainly happy to kind of donate my time and do this again um because again i think this is really really important for, for the kids and for the state as a whole and you know, I don't want to speak for ODE, but I, I do uh, recall that uh, when we initially presented uh, these results, they said, one, that they were working on trying to track some of the information we hadn't been tracking in terms of, um, you know, what, what kids are doing. Uh, but also, I, I believe they're interested in looking at it again in the spring. I don't know that I'll have uh, the time, but I, I would certainly try, but I, I know Vlad uh, will do it. Wonderful. Thank you.
Um, we have a question from Tracy about whether um, you have any information specifically for voucher students as well, students who are using school vouchers. We don't have that. Uh, in general, uh, a lot of the information for voucher students uh, is, is uh, in either other data sets or non-existent. And so we had a law passed a couple of years ago that basically said we didn't have to test them with state tests. And, uh, and so we know very little about voucher students. Interesting, thank you. We have a couple of questions here that are related to online learning, which you were talking about a little bit earlier. And so you may have already addressed some of this, but I'll read them to see if you have additional comments. Um, Kathleen's asking about how the results relate to families who may or may not have access to online learning platforms during the quarantine and online learning. And Sarah is asking about the level of attendance and engagement with remote learning um, and if you have any data on how that relates to the available technology and Wi-Fi access. Yeah, I mean, those are all great questions. So I would say, uh, you know, again, I, I think we, we can't speak very well to any of those questions. Uh, I guess I will say that the third grade um, results we have are from all from last year, really from, from the fall to the spring. So my sense is that most districts by, by October of 2020 had gotten students set up with, with the technology they needed, had gotten them set up with the platforms they needed. Now, I think internet access is still definitely an issue um, in, in especially rural parts of Ohio. And that was something we had initially started to look at Unfortunately, it turns out that the kind of data that the FCC collects on, on high-speed internet is pretty worthless, um, that there are places in Ohio that we know don't have high-speed internet, but the federal government says does. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, that, you know, I think that is definitely a problem, and it's just a, a, a measurement problem for us. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, what was the last, the last question, Rebecca? Um, yeah, it was about- um... Oh, uh, attendance, attendance, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I, I know that the Ohio Department of Education put out some, um, some attendance analysis as well. Um, so they had a data, um, a data snapshot in the fall. And I, I believe they did find significant increases in um, chronic absenteeism. Um, and I think they did some analysis, I think, by mode of instruction. Now, I think one of the challenges is, you know, measuring attendance for online learning is just fundamentally different. So how, how to compare those, I think, is, is very difficult. Um, so I don't know, Stefan, if you have, have thoughts. Yeah, no, I don't think you can compare them uh, very well, uh, but they, the, those data are on the ODE website. Um, I think the most concerning part of that analysis was just that there were so many unaccounted for students uh, that we didn't know where they were. Right, right. Um, we have an anonymous question about um, who's thanking you for your great study and says perhaps part of the continued learning loss may also be due to the impact of COVID on teachers. This has been a difficult time for them and resources the teachers have access to both for themselves and their students are likely different. If you could speak to that at all. Well, I think, I mean, I think for sure, I think that's definitely, I, I don't know if it, to what extent it contributes to learning losses, but even if it doesn't, I mean, we know, we know it's, I mean, an overwhelming two years for, for teachers. Um, not just because of the, all the adjustments and having to go back and forth between online and remote, but also because I know that, you know, the behavioral issues for students who are coming back after not being in the class. Um, so, you know, I, I, I definitely, um, I, I, I'm definitely grateful for the incredible work that teachers do. And uh, I can't imagine just how difficult um, it, it is right now to, to be in that position. So um, I guess, you know, I could not, I cannot agree more that I think, um, you know, it, it's, a, I just don't know what to do about it. You know, I don't know, you know, we know students need to be in school. We know we need to be learning. Um, and so the question is, what can we do to make life easier for teachers? Um, and I would be all in favor of really, I think, uh, you know, anything we can come up with that makes sense in that area. Yes, and we did see a comment earlier too when someone was asking about the social emotional support saying, are we talking about social emotional support for students or for teachers? And maybe part of that is social emotional um, and uh, mental health support for teachers as well um, could have impacts on students. And um, just, on, uh, just on that front, I, just, I do want to recognize that, you know, I, I know, especially here in Columbus, I know that they have really invested in like their employee assistance program um, mm -hmm. and making, making various kinds of counseling services more easily available, including in the virtual format. So my sense is that there is a lot of innovation going on in districts. I don't know in all districts, but um, if I guess if there's one good thing that comes out of the pandemic, it's, it's that districts have, have really stepped up, I think, in this space and have tried, I don't know how well, but have tried to really um, increase um, services in, in that space for, for teachers and other kinds of staff. That's great. Thank you. Hopefully that hopefully that lasts. Um, we have a question. I know you spoke a little bit about um, year round learning, but maybe this will give you a chance to expound if you have other comments on that. Um, and uh, Nidhi asks, I'm curious about whether you think year round learning might help minimize the overall loss since it would minimize the learning loss that previously only happened during summer breaks. 
Um, so Stefan, I mean, Stefan probably knows that literature well. My sense is um, the evidence for year-long learning is not particularly positive, it's not particularly negative. But I think one of the challenges is, you know, what we, what we, how we define year-round year learning. Um, and before the pandemic, year-round learning was still the same number of school days. It was just spread out mm -hmm. over the course of the year. So it did not mean more learning time. Um, so if, if year-round learning means more learning time, then I think that, that is a very different conversation than kind of how we think about it traditionally. Um, and I, obviously, I mean, you know, there's trade-offs. I know districts are concerned about, you know, student burnout and students not being excited if they're all doing this academics all year. Um, so I know that in many places they want to use the summer for enrichment type programming. Um, so, I mean, it's a delicate balance. And, and so, yeah, I don't have, I don't have good, good insights, but I do think um, increasing learning time is really in terms of policies that we have available policy levers. That's one area where I think we could be doing more um, and obviously compensating, compensating teachers and everybody else for the extra time as well. Um, but, but my sense is increasing learning time, whether it's through extended school year or through other ways, I think is really one area where we could have a big impact. Um, and and that, that has some evidence base for it from the, before the pandemic. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with everything you just said and the characterization of the literature. And um, in terms of you know, learning gaps or achievement gaps and, uh, by race and socioeconomic status and gender, I think the evidence is also a little bit mixed. It seems that um, uh, girls and, and more advantaged students um, uh, and, and white students uh, you know, make up quite a bit of ground sometimes uh, during the summer uh, and that uh, during the school year, uh, the, uh, the, the gap narrows again and then it expands again during the following summer. Um, and, uh, but I've never seen a study that uh, with year round learning that shows me that that goes away. Um, and it seems to depend on what tests you use to, to measure um, growth and achievement gaps, what answers you get. So I think the evidence is mixed. And I guess I just I just add one thing, and this is a kind of echo what I said earlier. So I know many districts that have um, ramped up their summer offerings. Um, I guess the thing that concerns me the most is these are still optional, um, and and I, I think with any kind of optional programming, you are not going to target the population that you want to target. And and so we have here at Ohio State, we have something called the first year experience program for incoming students. And the former director of that was a first generation college student from Appalachia. And I remember he gave a he gave a speech uh, a talk once, and he basically said, you know, if you want to help first generation students. There's one thing you got to remember: these students don't do optional. So anything you want to have that that helps higher students, if it's optional, it's probably not going to reach them. And I think that is especially true with some of these summer offerings. That you know that the students who need the additional time the most are not necessarily the students who are going to opt in. And so I think figuring that out is really really important. And I think if we just say we'll make you know here's a buffet of options, take you pick. Um, I, I, I worry that's not going to get the job done in terms of closing the achievement gaps. It might even potentially exacerbate it if the kinds of students who opt in are the students who, who are already doing fairly well. And I think there's a more general point to make here about the pandemic that people don't know how to treat um, absences anymore, right? Is this, we, is this still truancy? Do we still want to consider this a, a crime in, in Ohio um, and, uh, and hold parents accountable? It seems that the pandemic has left a lot more room to make schooling in general optional. Uh, which is why we're losing track of these students. Uh, and so it seems that everything points to providing more structure. Uh, and uh, it's not just about making the tutoring mandatory, but just figuring out a way to make school mandatory. And this is my personal view uh, on this, but without that structure, it seems that people will disappear like the, the ODE data uh, showed. Interesting, thank you. And we have a good question um, from Teresa. Did your research find any outliers? Were there districts where this gap didn't exist or even improved that we would be able to learn from? And we did this initially um, uh, where we tried to estimate uh, by district and come up with a distribution. Um, and that's a really noisy, hazardous process. Um, but there was a group of top quartile districts uh, that basically where the students basically did just as well as they had uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, and anyone below uh, that top quartile, uh, it got worse and worse. And Vlad showed some results based on baseline achievement uh, that basically corroborate that, that the losses are, are for those uh, uh, that had lower uh, baseline achievement. Would you like to add, Vlad? Yeah, that, yeah, that's right. So, so we did, we, I think we did this more systematically for the initial third grade analysis and we definitely, there was definitely a range. So, so you know, the averages hide a lot of variation. There were places of the state that did just almost as well as usual. And there was places where the gaps were much larger than, than the averages. Um, we did not do that kind of systematic analysis for, for the other grades in the, in the spring analysis. 
Um, but that is a great question. Was, yes. Yes. Yeah, but my I, recollection was that the ones in the top quartile tended to be more affluent or there was some correlation, but it yeah, was I think, I think, this. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Tracy has a question following up on your discussion about summer school and year round learning. Um, is there research out there about the efficacy of paying students like a summer job to ascend, attend summer school to catch up? Many students, especially low income, need to work during the summer and during the school year to make ends meet. Yeah, that's a great question. So, so you know, I'll share the research I know, maybe Stefan knows others. I say, uh, you know, I think the best evidence we have actually comes from not, not summer school, but like summer internship programs. And there was actually a really um, high quality randomized uh, evaluation in New York City where they paid especially high risk teenagers basically to, 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 to go work instead of, instead of not working or go do like an internship type program. And um, they did not look at academic outcomes as far as I remember, but uh, juvenile crime went down pretty dramatically. So even if it doesn't affect learning losses, I think paying students to go to school in the summer could have all sorts of other benefits. So the other example I'll give is um, in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Um, Lawrence was taken over by the state and they, they had a pretty aggressive school overhaul program. Part of that was um, during their two week spring break, they had a special kind of intensive learning academy and it was optional, but they basically tried to bribe students to go. And they said, if you come by the end, we'll give you a bunch of gift certificates. Mm -hmm. um, and they got very high take up among students who attended. And just over a course of two weeks, they had really incredible learning gains from that very, very intensive, um, very targeted intervention. So I think, I think incentives for students to participate um, to, to me suggests that it's definitely worth trying, especially with, you know, now that we have the federal money, I mean, uh, it seems like, you know, it seems like it, it can't hurt and it probably could do quite a bit of good. Stefan, I don't know, is there other, other stuff out there? Uh, the New York study was the one that came to my mind. I think it was in JPAM or something. Um, that was, yeah, that was an interesting study. And so I think it might have had some short term academic benefits, but it was the long term employment and uh, correctional sort of benefits that were most intriguing. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Hybrid. We don't know if hybrid means um, students come to school half a week and stay home half a week, or whether it means younger grades come in every day and older grades are home all the time. So I wish, you know, I wish, I wish we had better data about what, what in, you know, both online and, and hybrid learning has meant. Um, and unfortunately, at least for last school year, I don't, I don't think we have that data. I do believe they have gotten, they've started collecting more data since for the, for the current school year. I just wanted to add one more thing about the uh, virtual schools, which are all technically charter schools in Ohio. Um, Ohio Virtual Academy, I think, doubled its enrollment uh, since the pandemic started. So I think they might, I don't remember what the numbers are, but they're in the thousands and they doubled their enrollment. Um, so that influx of students from traditional districts, I, I just don't know how we disentangle that um, mm -hmm. and figure out if they do this online thing well or not. Um, but I will agree with Vlad that at least based on year to year learning gains that we're expecting in traditional public schools, um, there online kids are not keeping up in, in virtual schools. They're falling behind very quickly. And this was true before uh, the pandemic. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to reiterate that kind of evidence that we had before the pandemic makes none of this surprising, what happened with remote instruction. Students just learn dramatically less when they're learning from home uh, than when they're in school. And this was always true, even by people uh, like virtual schools who do it for a living. Yeah, that's a great, great point, thank you. And we have one final question um, that I'll, we'll wrap up with here. Um, Cristala, uh, or sorry, Crystal asks, understandably, you aren't state officials, but can your findings play an important role in state funding considerations for public school districts as they try to help students catch up to benchmarks and grade level standards? I know we've spoken to this a little bit, but just um, allowing you to respond to that and any final comments as we wrap up here. Uh, you know, again, I, I, I'm not an expert on funding. I would say in terms of state policy, I think the one area where I think, you know, where I have really strong opinions based informed by this is, is just the importance of tests and the importance of having high participation rates. So one of the things we did last year is we really relaxed some of the state requirements about, about how many students were expected to take state tests. And I think, um, I think that was probably not a great thing long term. So, so, so ensuring that students are taking tests, we can track their, their um, trajectory is really important. Now, how we use the tests for accountability, I, I think that's a different issue. But collecting data versus accountability, I think are, it's really important to separate those two. Um, and I think collecting the data is really important so we can keep tracking these students to see, to see you know, what, the, the, um, you know, what, what their learning journey looks like going forward. Stefan, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I'm not a very colorful commentator, I guess. I will say that in other presentations we've given to the state, uh, it was pretty clear that the state 
one was um, worried, and this was very early on, worried about the losses that we described to them and uh, that identifying supports um, was their number one priority. Uh, so the Ohio State School Board and the Ohio Department of Education had extensive conversations about uh, how do we support districts better um, uh, during this period when uh, kids are, are falling behind so quickly. Uh, but that's the extent uh, to which I, I, I can speak to that. Great, thank you. Well, thank you um, both for being here and to all our attendees for attending um, the session today. And we hope you will join us for our next research forum, forum coming up in March. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye.